When we talk about human potential, have you ever wondered what account for the huge disparity in results and performance between one person and another? You know, a person who's making $250,000 a year is not 10 times smarter or better than a person who's making $25,000 a year. Why is there 10 times the difference in income? And you go all the way up the ladder to a person who's making $2.5 million a year, is that person 100 times better, smarter than the person making $25,000 a year? Impossible. In a recent study of IQ, they picked a thousand men and women out of the population and tested them for IQ. They found that the top person in that thousand selection was only two and one half times smarter than the bottom person in that selection of IQ. Only two and a half times the disparity, and that's probably true over the whole population. But what accounts for this great difference? Opportunity follows difficulty. But here's what you must learn to do. Underline these two words in that key phrase. Take advantage. Underline those two. You must learn to take advantage of the spring. See, just because spring rolls around is no sign you're going to look good come fall. You got to do something with it. In fact, you have to get good at one of two things in life. Planting in the spring or begging in the fall. Or get somebody to do it for you. See, those are about the only alternatives. Now here's what else you must do. Take advantage of the springs quickly because there's only a few. Just a handful of springs have been handed to each of us. They don't come forever. Life is fairly brief. So you got to read every book you can get your hands on on what to do with your springs while they're here. And take advantage, they soon run out. The Beatles wrote, life is so short. And for John Lennon, it was extra short. But life is brief. Elton John sings, she lived her life like a candle in the wind. It's brief. So whatever you're going to do with your life, you got to get at it. Don't just let the springs pass, pass, pass. Here's the third major lesson in life to learn. Learn how to protect your crops all summer. You got to take care of what you start. Sure enough, as soon as you've planted your garden in the spring, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. And here's the next bit of truth. They will take it unless you prevent it. And that's the third major skill to learn. You've got to learn to prevent the intruder from taking all the good you start. It's one of the challenges. Here's two key phrases under number three. First one, all good will be attacked. On this planet, maybe not the next one we get to, but on this one, all good will be attacked. Every garden will be invaded. Not to think so is naive. And here's the second phrase. All values must be defended. Political values, social values, community values, family values, marriage values, friendship values, business values. Every garden must be tended all summer. Third major lesson. Now here's number four. Fourth major lesson in life to learn. Learn how to reap in the fall without complaint. Learn to reap come harvest time without complaint. Take full responsibility for what happens to you. It's one of the highest forms of human maturity, accepting full responsibility. It's the day you know you've passed from childhood to adulthood, the day you accept full responsibility. And another note. Learn to reap in the fall without apology. Without apology if you do well. And without complaint if you don't. That's maturity. Well, we talk about dealing potential. We come down to a very simple formula that I came up with some years ago that probably explains it a little bit. The formula starts off with what we call IA, which is inborn attributes. That's the quality, the intelligence, the ability, the temperament, the things that you're born with that you can't really change very much. Plus, acquired attributes. Now, acquired attributes are very important. Those are your 
education, your training, your skill, your experience, knowledge, wisdom, and so on. Multiplied times A, which is your attitude, equals individual human potential or individual human performance or individual human results, if you like. Now, of these three, inborn attributes are largely fixed at birth. Acquired attributes can be changed, but it takes a while to change them, although sometimes they can be changed very rapidly. One valuable piece of information can dramatically change your effectiveness. But attitudes can be increased or decreased dramatically in seconds. We talked about that before, and a very powerful way to instantaneously improve your attitude is to say to yourself, I, will, I believe something wonderful is going to happen to me today. As we said before, our expectations about outcomes determines our attitude. In other words, if you expect things to turn out well, you're going to have a positive attitude. If you expect things to turn out negatively, you're going to have a negative attitude. And the wonderful thing is you can manufacture your own expectations. I mean, you can expect whatever you want. You can expect good things, you can expect negative things, and chances are you won't be disappointed. Where do our expectations come from? Our expectations come from our beliefs, if you like, and our values. These are the core or the central motivating factors that our personality, our beliefs, and values. And this brings us to an understanding of human potential. It means that basically our attitude is the outward expression of what is going on internally, consistent with the mental laws that we talked about. And with regard to belief, each of us has a bundle of beliefs way down deep inside, which psychologists call the self-concept. Now, the self-concept, or the discovery of it, has been considered by many to be the most important single breakthrough in understanding human performance in the 20th century, and I personally agree. The self-concept is like, if you wanted to use a military analogy, is the command center. Or if you wanted to use a technological analogy, it is the central program of your basic computer. It is a bundle of beliefs, values, attitudes, feelings, ideas, and so on, which are stored away down inside, which are a result of virtually every experience you've ever had in your life. And some researchers say that the self-concept begins to form even before birth. But this self-concept, once it is in place, precedes, predicts, and determines your levels of effectiveness and performance in every area of your life. Your self-concept becomes the command program center or the master program. The self-concept or this bundle of beliefs then determines what you will say, what you will do, how you will act, how you feel and react, and so on. What does it mean? It means that all improvements in your external life, all changes in your reality, begin with a change in the self-concept. Let me give you an understanding of by how it means. Here's, here's a very simple graph. We talk about human potential, we say the average person uses 10% or less of their potential. According to the research, it's probably much less. Stanford Brain Institute in Santa Clara, California estimates that it's probably closer to 2%, but we'll be generous, we'll say the average person is using 10%. It means that in the best of cases, the average person, you and I, have 90% of our potential untapped. One of the great philosophers, Oliver Wendell Holmes, said the great tragedy of the average person is they go to their grave with their music still in them. They're still functioning on far, far less of their potential. So this is human potential. We find there's a direct relationship between human potential and the self-concept. That since our self-concept, or our estimates of ourselves, if you like, are usually far lower than they need to be, our level of performance and effectiveness is far lower too. And we know that our self-concept is largely subjective. What does that mean? It means that the self-concept, what we believe to be true about ourselves, is really not based in reality. It's based on information that we've taken in. It's people who win lotteries are often flat broke two or three years later. They just burn the money because the money is far beyond their self-concept. If you go 10% or more below your self-concept level of income, you find yourself scrambling. You work harder. You work longer. You think more creatively. You look at different ways to increase your income or, or second income opportunity. The only way to improve any part of your life, including your income, is to raise your self-concept level of income by beginning to think about yourself continually in terms of earning more money. If you want to lose weight, the only way you can lose weight is what? Is to think thin, by beginning to think of yourself as a thinner person. If you want to become a more popular, a more loving, a happier person, a healthier person, you have to begin to think over and over about those things until they become part of your new self-concept. And we'll talk about that a little bit later it's an essential part of programming your mind for success. Your overall self-concept is determined by the average of your self-concepts in all the areas that you consider important. Now, your self-concept is made up of three critical parts. The first part of the self-concept is the self-ideal. The self-ideal is yourself as an employee, how much you like yourself as a boss, 
how much you like yourself as a money earner, a professional speaker, an athlete, and so on, how much you like yourself, your level of self-esteem, your overall emotional feeling about any area of your life determines your performance and effectiveness in that area. Wonderfully enough, since you become what you think about, your self-concept is malleable, your self-esteem can be built by repeating over and over again, I like myself. 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 The more you say, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, the more you repeat that over and over again, the more your self-esteem goes up. The more your self-esteem goes up, the more your overall self-concept goes up. When your overall self-concept goes up, you perform better at everything else that you attempt. That every single time you say, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself. It's like pumping yourself up psychologically. Everything that happens that causes your self-esteem to go up causes you to perform better. Everything that happens that causes your self-esteem to go down causes you to perform worse, make more mistakes, be unhappier, and so on. Now, a critical point about liking yourself, about self-esteem and self-liking, is that number one is you can never like or love anybody else more than you like or love yourself. That your level of self-esteem is the determinant of the quality of the relationships you have with others. And number two is you can never expect anybody else to like or respect you more than you like or respect yourself. And how much you like and respect yourself determines their attitude toward you.